best uh, scientific and educational practices and strengthening curricula, developing core sets of knowledge for graduates and students. And I think this is really key because these interventions are critical to build the next generation of climate scientists and climate activists. And I do want to refer back to the Stockholm uh, Plus 50 consultations in Mutare and really say how impressed I was by the voices of the young people and the knowledge of the young Zimbabweans who joined us in uh, Mutare. So certainly I think we have an aspiring generation of climate scientists and climate activists, and that is very good. Ladies and gentlemen, UNDP and UNITAR supported the government of Zimbabwe to develop the National Climate Change Learning Strategy and Action Plan, which we hope you will find helpful uh, in terms of, of moving uh, forward with um, uh, climate change and the role of academia. Let me finish here to give more time for uh, the panel and for the interaction. Uh, thank you again for joining us this morning. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing your views, your ideas and your recommendations. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Amir, uh, for re-emphasizing the importance and role of the academia and the private sector. As he said, this is your platform today. So we look forward to hearing from you. Uh, without wasting time, let me invite uh, the representative from the Embassy of Sweden. I think we made it clear when we started that these consultations are being made possible through support uh, from the government of Sweden. So we have a, a representative from the Embassy. So over to you, Lucinda. Good morning, Mr. Shoko from the, from the ministry, Mia Sepu, UNDP resident representative. Ladies and gentlemen, all protocols observed. It is a pleasure to be in Bulawayo this morning at the final of the national consultation meetings in Zimbabwe that have been part of the buildup to the environmental conference that will happen in Stockholm on the 2nd and 3rd of June. Stockholm plus 50 is about commemorating the very first UN environmental conference in 1972, where the link between environmental issues and poverty were acknowledged. It is about building forward and it is an opportunity to chart the course towards a green and a fair future for us all. It is about accelerating the green transition and to involve and give voice to civil society, academia, the business sector and youth at local levels. The planet is in a state of emergency, a climate crisis, seeing increasing numbers of storms, hurricanes, droughts and wildfires a biodiversity crisis, seeing accelerating extinction of species. And this is here and now. It is not in a distant future, not in a faraway land. If we fail to address this crisis, we will see more hunger, more pandemics, more injustice, more conflict, and more forced migration. The crisis is being felt worldwide, but Zimbabwe is particularly vulnerable. An economy heavily reliant on raid-fed agriculture is hugely exposed, and the negative consequences are felt by government, civil society, and business. And it is crucial that we all come together to acknowledge and address these issues. Much is at stake for the private sector unpredictable seasons, extreme weather, and a degraded environment 
make running a business a challenge. And business has a huge role to play when it comes to facing this challenge. Setting sustainability standards, awareness, reporting, and then the reduction of waste and carbon emissions, making responsible investments are just a few of the actions that can be taken by the private sector. And these actions should not be seen as corporate social responsibility. They should be seen as making good business sense and should ultimately result in a positive change to the bottom line. Thank you to all for being here today. And I hope that this will be a good opportunity to listen and to act on the environmental challenges that are facing Zimbabwe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucinda, for emphasizing the triple threats uh, that the globe is facing and what this means for our survival and uh, what we need to do to make sure that we are able to address those challenges. Uh, so we are now going to move into a plenary session. These consultation meetings are being held under what are called uh, leadership dialogues uh, or leadership dialogue themes. We have uh, leadership dialogue one, uh, which is basically reflecting on the urgent need for actions to achieve a health planet and prosperity for all. We have leadership dialogue two, uh, which is achieving a sustainable and inclusive recovery from the coronavirus disease. So as we try to recover, how do we do this in a sustainable manner? Then leadership theme or leadership dialogue three, which is focusing on accelerating the implementation of the environment dimension of sustainable development in the context of the decade of action and the delivery for sustainable development. So I'm going to invite people up front uh, that are going to lead us in these conversations, uh, who will be posing questions and they'll be responding and hopefully we have enough time to go into further discussions depending on how we are able to progress. So can I have the pleasure of inviting the Business Council for Sustainable Development up front? Um, the representative, then uh, I think that's Mr. Mududu Zimube. Oh, oh, comes. Oh, engineer. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, the program here is indicating something else. <laughs> Apologies for that. Okay. Then uh, uh, a representative from Nasty University, I think it's Dr. Nube. Oh, can I just use? Thank you. Uh, then a representative from the Minister of Environment, I think it's Mr. Shoko. Then we have a representative from the Green Building Council of Zimbabwe, uh, Mr. Mike Juru. Thank you. Uh, we are looking for four people. I think four. Yeah. Yeah. No, okay. Um, no, it's fine. I think they can. <laughs> yeah. That's fine, thank you. Yeah, so I'll, I'll be posing questions and uh, I'll be inviting the panelists to respond to those questions. Uh, so I'll start with Mr. Shoko uh, from the ministry. And this falls under leadership dialogue one. So we want to understand uh, from the ministry what policies, structures, programs are being put in place by the government of Zimbabwe to enable the country to take urgent actions to achieve a health planet and prosperity for all? 
uh, as reflected in the theme of the Stockholm Plus 50 meeting. So we'll be happy to hear some of those actions that you are taking as a government uh, in terms of coming up with policies, structures, programs to ensure that we achieve that desired objective. So over to you, Mr. Shoko. Thank you very much once again, facilitator. Uh, I want to begin by <clears throat> making the house become aware uh, that uh, as a ministry, we have since started reviewing a, a good number of our policies uh, to do with the environment and of the to do with the environment. You know, a, a good number of our policies were crafted a long time ago. And uh, since then, new developments have emerged. And we, we thought it pertinent as government to say, why, why don't we review these policies so that they are in tandem with what is obtaining now? The environment policy itself is being reviewed. We also have um, the Environmental Management Act. We are actually reviewing that. We are also looking at uh, even the wildlife policy. We are working towards, we are actually reviewing, actually towards the end of uh, the review of that policy. And uh, how are we doing it? This is done through consultative processes where we travel right around the country and get views from the people after we've had to analyze our existing policies and identify gaps. So what we are doing basically now is to address the gaps that are there uh, in the old policies so that they actually run with what is happening today. I also want to let people know that uh, in the ministry with various uh, departments, with the Environmental Management Agency, which is responsible for the main act of the environment, which is the Environment Management Act. We also have the Zimpax, Zimbabwe Wildlife Parks Management Authority, which looks at our wildlife in total. And we have the Forestry Commission. Those contribute to the structures that manage the environment. So uh, we, are, we have also sat down and also and come up, you know, as a country, we are signatory, signatory to a, a number of conventions. And uh, you realize that the Stockholm 50, the Stockholm Convention of 1972 is actually the starting point of an environmental management where countries came together and then started to look at their activities in terms of an environment. And uh, since then, we have uh, become party to a number of conventions and uh, which are decentralized to country level. So that we have also come up with various strategies. For example, we have uh, what we now call the climate change response strategy that uh, was launched sometime in, in the year 2015 where we try to address, where we try to work with the communities to make sure that we, we, we address the effects of climate change. And they've got a lot of uh, programs that are being run under that strategy. We also have revised the nationally uh, determined contributions uh, towards how we manage the environment. That's a strategy. And we also have the national biodiversity strategy where we come up with the programs that are lined up in order to make sure that we, 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 we use the environment in a sustainable manner. In short, so that uh, I will also leave time for my colleagues. Thus, in brief, we've got such strategies that we're having. And uh, we are also working with our partners. Uh, for instance, the UNDP, we have the Swedish Embassy, we have uh, AWEF, we have uh, a lot of companies, a lot of uh, partners that we work with in trying to make sure that we achieve the objective of the environment. Thank you for now. 
Mr. Facilitator. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello. Yes. Thank you very much, Mr. Shoko, for outlining those uh, policies uh, that you are reviewing to make sure that they address some of the challenges that we are facing as a country. And uh, you have highlighted a number of those. And uh, um, I think I can also confirm that I'm aware of those processes uh, that are happening and uh, they will help us to deal with some of these challenges. Let me go to uh, leadership dialogue uh, two in terms of the questions. And this is targeted at the Business Council for Sustainable Development of Zimbabwe and Green Building Council of Zimbabwe. So the question is, how can we create better performing industries and supply chains for a just transition, more sustainable economies, and which sectors are most critical? I think that this talk about uh, uh, transition, this uh, just transition. So as we move to make sure that our industries become greener uh, in light of uh, the challenges that we are facing, uh, industry is one of the biggest contributors in terms of uh, greenhouse gas em emissions, and these have got serious impacts in terms of uh, climate change. But what can we do to change that? So the question is, how can we create better performing industries and supply chains for a just transition to more sustainable economies uh, and which sectors are most critical? So over to you, Mr. Mdudu. Uh, is it engineer? Yeah. Yes. yes, 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 yes. Once again, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. As you heard, we are from BCSGZ, Bulawayo branch. The mm -hmm. Bulawayo branch is uh, headed by engineer Stephen Simon in second. That's why I'm Satak. OK. <clears throat> you are wondering why there are two people. I have given a, a brief account of uh, BCSGZ. And that brief account of business disease is crucial to some of the members who are not who are here and they are not our members. Uh, we have been calling for that membership and sometimes it's not easy uh, to, to, to be visiting them. But when they are here, we can make that call. Now, what is business disease? is an organization that started 29 years ago, 29 years ago, as Environmental Forum of Zimbabwe. Translated and transformed into Business Council for Sustainable Development. Its purpose is uh, em embraced on uh, raising awareness, conducting training, facilitation, as well as leading on the implementation. Why do that? This is a room for achieving the desired results. The development that we need. The sustainable development, the three pillars that we are talking about. Three pillars, the social, economic, and environmental. And beyond that. Uh, and to do that, we are calling upon the GRC. So you find business council for sustainable development is involved greatly in realizing GRC. What do I mean by GRC? governance, risk management, and compliance. Those three, they are key. If we want to move into greening, we want to achieve accountability. We want to achieve the participation of the public, private, and uh, the third P. What it can need to be? There are three P's, private, pri public, and uh, 
participation. So we are supposed to get involved, all of us. And when we do like that, we will be in a position to achieve sustainable development. Already the other previous speakers have already mentioned about that. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we said ZZ has got a constitution just like any other organ organization. And besides that, there's a management committee that is for VCSDZ. As well, there are technical committees, various technical committees uh, that are running in the country. One of them is the on water management. And water management is we are promoting integrated water resource management. Uh, the unfortunate, I'm the chairperson. The unfortunate, the unfortunate part, I'm the chairperson for that committee, and as well the branch chairperson. I'm covering for business design, and then we have got biodiversity, which we already mentioned about it. Uh, we have energy committee. We have got the waste management. Under waste management, there are a number of things. People are concentrating on the three areas. Hierarchy of waste management. It is no longer grave, I mean, cradle to grave. As far as you want to achieve sustainable development, we should think of cradle to cradle. So we go beyond the three areas, the four areas, the seven areas, we go into the nine areas. So as BSDZ, we are promoting that. Uh, we are also covering climate. We have got the climate change committee. In total, we have got 10 so far. I uh, wouldn't like to talk about them. Uh, besides uh, those committees, we have got the branches. The active ones are two. Harare and the Bulawayo. The Bulawayo has been participating in raising sustainable development, water conservation, waste management, biodiversity, particularly for schools, and so on. When we are, we are talking about the activities of research, this is uh, I will talk more. Okay. Um, now, besides this, that is embracing the aspects that uh, we have been asked to talk about. And I will do pass to uh, Mdudus to take us through. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, we asked you to discuss uh, the performance of our industries and the supply chain, uh, particularly uh, with the COVID uh, being around us for almost three years. Now, one of the key things each other that we realized um, was we're moving around industries in Zimbabwe, the most Asian industries that were first relaxed uh, had uh, this uh, regulations relaxed to us in the mining and the agricultural sector. So if we were to talk about particular um, sustainability without talking about those two, it becomes difficult. But now looking at the mining sector, uh, most of the pollution that is is coming around is coming from that sector. Environmental degradation that is coming is coming from that sector. And uh, what is happening in that sector is that uh, the issue of uh, polluter pays principle, yes, it's being applied. I heard Mr. Shoko uh, mentioning that they are, they are reviewing that. But now when it comes to the fines, we are going to discover that a mine that is making more than 50 kgs of gold per month is asked maybe to pay a level 12 fine, which is around 1,000 US dollars. And just because of that reason, they would continue polluting it without correcting the mistakes. So I think it's one thing that now I work for talking about sustainability that was supposed to review whereby uh, there's one uh, instance whereby uh, a giant was once shut down because of pollution in Zimbabwe, which was a step in the right direction when we're talking about uh, sustainable development. 
And then there's the uh, issue of waste management uh, in terms of the industries, whereby we're saying that solid waste uh, is uh, quite a problem. Recycling companies, we have uh, takers, but uh, there are very few. We're having a lot of actual right accidents. For instance, uh, Zimbabwe scored statistical, one of the highest. Our accidents are a bit high. But what happens to each to the scrap cars that were here? We're piling them up and we're creating actually what are some solid waste dumps that we cannot even manage. Talking about actually our waste dump that we have, uh, for instance, actually in Gold's Mine, uh, there are very few people I uh, visited there sometime last month, that area. One thing that I noticed, yes, there are people who are buying the waste and recycling it, but there are very few companies. And actually what the price actually that is, the waste is being sold is so low. And that actually what no one is really willing to take it up and, uh, and venture into that uh, site. And then there is actually what uh, the cross-cutting factor that is very important when we're talking about sustainable development, the energy sector. Now, we're seeing that uh, the government is relaxing uh, and licensing uh, private players in the, in the energy sector to try and uh, take uh, the sector up. But um, what is happening is that some uh, in that policy or in that field, there's some loopholes that are there that are forbid. Um, most companies, if you approach them, why don't you have a solar plant to sustain your, your plant? They will tell you that um, we cannot afford that. Maybe actually there's need for funding in that sector, whereby we're having only a giant companies like uh, PPC or mining companies are managing to uh, put up solar plants. But most of the companies are operating without those because they cannot afford. So maybe if we can actually uh, invest more in that sector, that would actually help uh, the business sector. And then there is cleaner production issue discount, whereby uh, companies should be audited independently uh, for cleaner production. Uh, the ones actually that are polluting less actually are be awarded for that. I think that would encourage actually companies to, add, to work towards that. Just in, in brief, um, I would actually uh, talk about those sectors uh, being key uh, for the recovery in terms of uh, the size uh, of COVID. And, um, the business sector uh, as a whole. Now, uh, talking about the commitments and uh, response uh, by the responsible principle, uh, principles, when the ministry should, uh, should invest more in terms of uh, personnel and manpower in, in those areas, especially in the mining sector. I will talk about that uh, much. I'm an environmental consultant. I spend my time uh, there in the bushes with these people. You're going to discover that um, case in points escorting area that area has got actually uh, several mines that are operating, but actually there are only two district officers operating in that area. They cannot really cover the whole region. So that is affecting uh, the entire uh, area. And then there's actually a discounting of what of cleaner protection that is supposed to be encouraged uh, by the what, by this sector. Whereby we should what we say we discount a company that is actually uh, doing very well in cleaner production. And then there is coming of SARS, the Standards Association of Zimbabwe, whereby actually they could relax their fees a bit so that uh, smaller or individual companies, smaller companies can actually uh, venture into join in. Because SARS also encourages cleaner production and uh, it looks at sustainable, uh, sustainable development beyond certification. And then there is actually what are the byproduct uh, signage whereby we're talking about secular economies for the what for the companies. Uh, companies should identify actually what the takers of their waste. Instead of dumping the waste, they should have actual takers for the waste, and that would actually what help us. Just in, uh, in brief, that's actually what I had. Thank you very much, Mr. Mududuzi, uh, for outlining uh, what may need to, 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 to be done to get. Uh, better performing industries. Uh, let me I'll come back to the uh, industry uh, to to the industry players, but let me move on to the academia. So I'll be switching between the academia and the industry in terms of the questions. So coming to the academia, uh, the question that I have here is: What are the? Oh, let me remove this. What are the biggest challenges we are facing in implementing commitments to the 2030 agenda and other environmental uh, commitments, especially multilateral environmental agreements that we have uh, adopted as a country with a view to promoting sustainable development? So what we would want to understand is what are some of the challenges that we are facing as a country in terms of implementing those commitments? So I guess it's uh, uh, Dr. Ngube, over to you. 
istanbona njani e nzakul ma singisi kunga si kutulim la mangla lo nyal tanda nyal kanya kongale ngalo kodwa nzati singisi manju kutong kumdangi right now that as the way um uh first of all uh i think i'll center it on two areas mm -hmm. is a, a major challenge in information there is a, a major challenge in information and general understanding of what we are discussing when we are talking about environmental issues and environmental affairs. So the ministry has been working very well in that direction, building capacity, building awareness, building knowledge, so that at least particularly people in industry start paying attention uh, to areas related to the environment. But the fundamental challenge that has been limiting implementation has been financing, also related to the absence of information. There is a lot of uh, money that is available or resources that are available uh, on the grand <coughs> environmental financing platforms, climate change financing flat platforms that could be as accessed not only by public sector players, but by industry as well. A platform such as the Green Climate Fund, platforms such as the Global Environmental Facility, Climate Investment Funds. But the question is, how do people get access to that so that they can implement a particular actions we have seen some action by the government in that direction but very limited action from industry in that direction so i think there's a need for a process of capacity building uh, also uh, letting people in industry know that uh, there are processes that could allow for instance for green development that could be supported by these platforms that exist uh, in in the discussions that have been raised by my colleagues here there were issues that were raised a discussing aspects of renewable energy, access to different forms of energy and so on. There are many methodologies around that could actually support the financing of that, the implementation of that. If they are well structured and well crafted, uh, there are many platforms that could support that. So I would zero it down to the need for information dissemination, capacity building, and the access to resources, not only at local scale, but also at global scale. Thank you, uh, Doctor, for that. Uh, let me go back to uh, industry. Um, what are the gaps that are there in greening the built environment, and what are the potential areas for intervention? what are the gaps that are there in greening the built environment and what are the potential areas of intervention so thank you i i wish we had the whole day or two days to uh to discuss that those it is worth well discussing um, that in view of the fact that 40 percent of carbon emissions they come from buildings and uh, when you talk of green buildings uh, it's not about a leak of paint on the wall that is green, but it's a whole lot of activities that are involved. The process that is from the design, construction, um, to the operation, and finally disposal, you know, it's at a certain point that building has to be pulled down. And uh, how are we saving the planet, the planet? So we have to start with the end in mind, the final product that we have, a green building over there. And where are we currently as, as Zimbabwe? Um, it's said to note that we only have one green building or a near green building, which was built way back in 95. That's East Get More. And um, yes, it talks about energy, uh, energy saving. Um, but th that's about it. You know, it doesn't talk about water. It doesn't talk about waste. It doesn't adequately cover the waste aspect. So the first aspect is our own curricula, how is it addressing the challenges? We said buildings are in charge of 40% of carbon emissions. And 28% of that comes from operating the buildings. And that is a fact that is supposed to be known by someone in school. And as they progress, uh, the impact of climate change, people, it's, it's remote to the bulk of the people, to the, the, the majority of the populace. They don't understand that the awareness is the most critical. And uh, if people are away, whatever that they do, it, it, it will impact positively to start to change. Right? I've talked about the curricula that is in the schools, the education system. Those green building is about the design. 
so that when it is a building is designed, it is catering for that. Now, when the construction is happening, again, we now talk to, of industry. Industry, the, you talk about the lights, the, uh, the bricks, everything that makes up a building. If you have to go back to what makes up a building, bricks, that's the environment. Cement, it comes from the environment. The power comes from the environment. The water comes from the environment. So everything about buildings, it comes from the environment. And what are we doing about it to protect? How are we recycling the bricks? When we demolish those bricks, are we creating waste or we are recycling so that we repurpose, we reuse the buildings, we, we save the environment ultimately? You progress from uh, the industry, both the manufacturing industry, producing products or certified products that are, that, that are, that are green. Then um, the management of buildings, where are the efforts that are being done to save energy? Where are the efforts that are being done to, uh, to save the water? Where are the efforts that are being done in buildings? 11% of waste is produced from buildings. And it is the very source that will enable the recycle industry to be created. If waste is separated from source, then the rest becomes easy. Now the challenge comes when everything is put in, in, one, in one bin, you now have more effort to be separating the waste. How do you then create money out of, how do you create a green economy when the waste is not, be, is, when the waste is not being uh, segregated? You move away from the waste, uh, this is the solid waste, the liquid waste, it all comes from the buildings again. And how is it separated? I always have a simple example of the, um, the brown waste and your waste that comes from the kitchen, the processing process of that water for it to be reusable, or it, it, it is much more costly. We mix that. I go back to the design. If all buildings are designed to separate the waste, it makes sense come end of day. It saves money when you, um, when you are then processing that water. Because the brown waste and the one from the kitchen, they're different, they require different level of chemicals, but because you have mixed the, you have mixed the waste, it becomes a, a serious challenge. I now move on to, um, that is on the operation side, I've talked about the waste, I've talked about the water, I've talked about uh, the energy. Uh, we have high rise buildings, and um, never mind the, about clean energy, but saving what we have. We all know that our production, our the biggest, chunk of our electricity comes from, um, from coal, um, which is the biggest emitter. And um, uh, yes, before we start talking about going solar, why don't we talk about spending less of that power? And having, yes, you can talk about LED lighting. And, um, but the question is, how do you enforce people then to be, LED lights are now mandatory, yes. But what of the heating elements, you know, the, the heaters that we use, the aircons, where is it mandatory for us to, to go back there and ensure and force people are, are using less energy? Then we go aspect about the, um, the, the, the solar clean energy, which also helps in saving the environment, right? We move on. Lastly, the last part of buildings is when the buildings are pulled down we never recycle those bricks. We never recycle that steel. If you look at steel, it's coming from the environment. The, uh, even the glass is coming from the environment. Everything about property comes from the environment. Mm. And yet we do not have an, an efficient way of recycling. Mm. So we are wasting waste. Uh, uh, construction waste, it, it, it heaps tons and tons of waste that, that could be used and utilized to again repurpose, rebuild the buildings and in the process save the environment. People never realize that the bricks bricks come from the environment. You have to the clay or be that even the cement, the cement bricks, you know, the blasting that you have to do, the energy that goes into it. So it's a whole process for us, a complete paradigm shift. What we need to understand to change from the curricula. Now we have the curricula, that's the first thing. And where people are trained in all those aspects, awareness, people have to know. We move on to the next to the next stage. People know, people in uh, the manufacturing industry, they're not doing the right things. What now has to be done? I think the green building come end of day, we need it to be standard. We need it to be mandatory. We all, we can have tax incentives 
uh, Minister of Environment is working on it, that a green building should have tax incentives because it is helping to protect the environment. There should be benefits to that. A, a, a non-green building, they can talk of increasing the capital gains. We should encourage people to then have green buildings. You can uh, retrofit your buildings for them to be green. So we talk about the standards. We need to have green building standards ultimately. And when we have standards, then it means that all new construction that is happening, it is made towards the old buildings are created to save the environment. And we are addressing the 40% contribution that comes from the buildings. And uh, I'm pleased to announce that or share with you that we as Green Building Council, we are working with Minister of Environment, also Minister of National Housing and Minister of uh, Local Government mm -hmm. uh, on uh, getting the standards. We are getting some assistance from, from UNEP, um, but we wish we could get more support. It would help. It will help the cause because this is serious. This is big. We need the awareness. So why everyone has to know that those buildings, those fancy houses that they want, they are impact to the environment. So thanks to the Minister of Environment, is work on your policies. Again, can all, they also be focused on um, hitting the nail by its head and advising people? Because you can have a policy on one hand, but do people understand it? I said I need a whole week. I'm sure. so passionate about I this. I could yeah. go on and on. But anyway, for now, those are my submissions. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, and, and, and I think for us, uh, this was an uh, opportunity to learn uh, because most of the times when you talk about climate change, no one thinks about the built environment and its role in terms of contributing towards climate change or even uh, mitigating and adapting. But I think this has been really helpful in terms of really understanding. And uh, I'm sure we'll find time uh, so that you can have a whole day to really educate us all in terms of what needs to be done. And we are happy that at least the ministry is uh, aware of those concerns and that as they develop their policies, they'll be able to uh, reflect that and make sure that the built environment is also taken into account. Can I go back to the academia again? Uh, Dr. Nube, back to you again. So how can the academia contribute to the implementing of the commitments to the 2030 agenda? and other environmental commitments, that is multi-environmental agreements that Zimbabwe is committed to. So what could be the role of the academia? So I think the first thing is we are very grateful for the support for such strategies, such as the climate change learning strategy. And uh, I think there is also a need for a cascading of such strategies and such information, first of all, in different government departments and to lower levels of government, uh, local government, uh, and uh, also coming up with different methodologies of scientific communication. Mm -hmm. We need to be able to break down the complex science into messages uh, that for different audiences. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, in academia, we, we, in most cases, we only stop at uh, academic journal publications. Mm -hmm. And if, if lucky, maybe you can get uh, one or two um, working papers, but still very complex information. So there is need to translate this information into workable, simple messages that could be understood by uh, different uh, members of society. And uh, they should not be wholesome in nature. They should target different uh, audiences. That is industry, uh, the common man, uh, a specific population group that is the youth, uh, and, and so on and so on. And also in, in accordance with income and geographical differentials, where you may not necessarily be able to get electronic information. Mm -hmm. We should have radio programs that discuss this. We should have simple uh, SMS messages that talk about and remind people about this information. So I would say the key issue is scientific communication, mm -hmm. um, downscaling of information for different audiences mm -hmm. and packaging it into particular messages that are useful for those who are expected to receive them. But even further, we expect to have a feedback loop from mm -hmm. the communities. We should be able to see if at all they are responding to what has been said and how they are responding. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nube. Uh, then maybe let me again go back to the private sector before I give uh, Jeremiah an opportunity to pose his question, follow-up questions, then we'll open it to the floor. What is the private sector doing to promote a healthy and prosperous uh, future for us all? I think this is in line with the uh, theme for the Stockholm 50 uh, international meeting. So we'd want to understand what is the private sector doing uh, to promote a health and prosperous future for us all? Yes, Mr. Mdudus. If he's good, are you ready? 
yeah. yeah much is may not have been directed to me but uh, uh -huh. like i said that uh, uh, I have so much to share about uh, green mm -hmm. buildings. Everything happens in buildings. Sure. We stay in buildings, we work in buildings, and we always move from one building to the other in, in our life. We, uh, we always move from one building to other in our life. So uh, centrally, buildings play a crucial role. We, you're talking about um, uh, the, f the future, so if you confirm again. Mm -hmm. To promote a healthy and prosperous future for us all. Right. We have all seen COVID, which is uh, a typical issue. And we are saying, on a green building, um, what are the aspects? A green building as covers the three pillars of sustainability, which is your economic, which is your social, and your environment. So that is covered under the social side. A green building is supposed to, uh, to be healthy. That's when you start talking about issues through the light, mm -hmm. uh, the light, natural lighting being preferred. So you find there are so many things that are supposed to be done the way the private sector is supposed to be playing a part in ensuring that uh, the workspace, people work in, in people work in buildings, the workspace is safe. Um, you talk of occupational health and safety. The aspects of the dust, how are you protecting the people from the dust that is coming outside? You know, yes, you talk about air ventilation, uh, the air conditioners, that there are some air conditioners that are wrong, that emit um, the wrong gases altogether. So um, you talk about the responsibility of the private sector. Up until now, I'm, it's said for me to be reporting this. Things are done on paper, but on the ground, nothing much is happening. We are all focused towards the business side of things, the profitability, and um, no one really makes an issue of it. I look forward to the day that uh, we have our national social security coming in uh, to check on the usability, usability of the buildings, even to actually be calling for the change in approach in the way that buildings, the workspace, or the living, uh, the living area is is looked at, it is everybody's game. It is everybody's responsibility, and again, standards they do come into place. When we have mandatory standards, people are then enforced without us pushing, without the policies, Ministry of Environment, which are enforceable. Uh, really, the private sector we are bent on profitability and. Uh, that comes secondary for us to think about uh, those aspects. Uh, there's enough lighting, we can use electricity. Life goes on. So please, if we could have standards, 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 mandatory, mandatory, mandatory standards. Thank you. Thank you. Um, earlier on, I talked about the uh, GRC. You are Mr. Doctor? Okay, thank you very much. The industry has got a lot to do in respect of risk management, risk assessment. And uh, a great deal of that is not being exercised across the board, not necessarily in the industries, even in the public sector. There is a lot that can, which can be done. So I'm um, enhancing on what uh, we are talking about, that uh, less tackle, risk, risk assessment, risk management. And then there are also issues pertaining to governance. If you don't have the correct structure uh, and so on, systems and uh, other related aspects, in respect of the seven S's. There are seven S's for us to achieve sustainable development. Seven of them. If we don't follow that, it's very difficult whether, I mean, the industry to move forward in achieving greening, to achieving what we, we are talking about. Even on the having a healthy planet, it will be very difficult. Mm -hmm. If those seven S's are not on the ground. Okay. Uh, I know my counterpart here will be in a position also to add one or two things. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, just a, a brief, uh, when you're talking about what the industry is currently doing, uh, some companies have moved uh, forward actually to get actually uh, certified with SARS, International Standard of uh, 
International Association of Standards, uh, Zimbabwe. Now, uh, there, there are beyond certification requirements that are there, in which actually sustainable development is one of them. Whereby actually what we've got companies that are working towards that, but there's still a gap uh, we have to admit that. Like uh, he was me mentioning that uh, we've got only one green building that is there. Mm -hmm. Some of these standards were more actually focused on what, on profits rather than actually what uh, on the environment. Mm -hmm. So if actually there could be maybe education uh, or a way, way by actually what we educate the, what, uh, the senior management, whereby now we turn um, the environment into money. Uh, and link the environment into the return on investment. Because once actually you mentioned that I've got an environmental program that you want to put in place, they are going to kill what uh, you're going to be limited by the fact, how is it, how are we going to make money out of that? So if you actually can, can have funding, maybe independently, a company is getting that towards the environment, that would assist a lot. Thank you. Sorry, just one more. <laughs> I hope you won't get bored of my voice, uh, but probably this is an opportunity for us to be sharing. Uh, talk about the private sector. Our constitution, section 73, it talks about environmental rights. Mm -hmm. So where they arise, their obligations. Sure. So it actually obligates a, in, in, a, everyone, which includes organizations, to be protecting the environment. So from a constitutional point of view, everyone in Zimbabwe is a responsibility and an yes. obligation to ensure mm -hmm. that you are safe. Mm. But you are also responsible for ensuring that I am safe. So we have to comply with our commission. You were talking about governance. Mm -hmm. The first aspect about corporate governance is compliance. Yeah. You, we move on. Um, the, for ZSE, which is our um, bows for listed companies, um, section 399 of the listing regulations, it talks about companies being required to undertake sustainability reporting which is they have to report on the um, um, impact onto the environment. How did they make their money? Uh, fair and fine, but again, you know, organizations are compromised. ZSC is compromised in the sense that it's voluntary to list. Yet you can have mandatory um, requirements that people are supposed to disclose. How many companies are complying with, um, with, with sustainability reporting? And if they are complying, are they really addressing the issues of their impact? um objectively and a ZSC if they have to be too stringent it becomes too expensive for companies to list they will lose so they are compromised they may be it's on paper it could be documented but on the ground uh, the application will be different mm -hmm. so there's need for agent innovations on the private sector for them to do the right thing somehow sure sure thank you Thank you very much, Mr. Juru, for those uh, inputs. Um, I think we now open it to the floor. I think you have heard uh, in terms of uh, the, what industry is doing or what industry thinks and what the academia thinks and what they are doing. But it's now an opportunity to also fire questions and also the ministry is also there. So we'd want to hear from you in terms of uh, your reflections. Over to you, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> I, I, we have had an interesting contribution from Mr. Mjuru, Mr. Juru, and uh, I'm one advocate. I will go with him. Unfortunately, we have not invited the city council because on the management of the West. I like the way we, you put it across. The worst from the kitchen and the worst from the bathroom. That is treated different. Currently, there is a major thrust in the country of replacing the old sewer pipe networks in the country, in the city councils. We have got new suburbs which are coming up. Why can't we rope in the city councils? Straight away, they put two lines for the sewer and for the kitchen disposal. That can be done. You don't need to wait because already they are replacing the pipes. <clears throat> yes, it's going to involve quite a lot of money, but I think it's better we start discussing along those lines. 
Then, um, Mr. Juru, you mentioned about uh, the ZSE, about the companies reporting on the sustainability. I would move a step further. We are in the process as a nation of revamping the Commons Act. Whether private or public listed, once that clause is inserted in the Commons Act and empowers the Ministry of uh, Environment to also take an active role, I think that will help a lot. I put the challenge to you, Mr. Juru, so that you can take it up with the Institute of Directors and push it forward and see whether all companies, whether SME, mid, uh, large companies, as long as you are formalized and registered, you just have to comply with the rest of other obligations which every private company has to comply with. And then on the communication, Dr. Nguyen, I think you need to target community leaders. You must come up with programs as the academia to involve the community leaders who have got an influential role within the community. And I think if you check with political parties, what if you, they target community leaders. Why can the academia also have programs where they educate, they train, they empower the community leaders, and then that information can easily be filtered right across the country. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I see just, uh, okay, there then, okay. Thank you, my name is Jonathan Tube. Um, I've got a direct question to the representative of uh, Minister of Tourism. I've been driving along the roads, especially the Midland side. Um, I think for recording purposes, uh, they're asking you to stand up. Oh, they want me to stand up, thank yes. you. <clears throat> I've mentioned my name is Jonathan Tube. So I said, I've been driving along the roads, especially the Midland side. There is some mining that is happening there, especially chrome-related mining. And the damage to the environment that is happening, what is the ministry doing? I'm not going to mention the nationalities here, but you know them. What is the ministry doing in terms of reclamation of land, in terms of restoration of the environment on those instances? If you miss the road, definitely you are going to go into a ditch which has been formed, and these things are very clear. Uh, the next question is to say, the levels of fines that Emma is um, meeting on uh, defaulters, I know they are set by government, but uh, to what extent do you influence those levels uh, in terms of trying to restore uh, and bring sanity to the people who are damaging the environment? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Ronim Baisa from Zimbabwe Sunshine Group. Uh, so my first uh, a, a comment is on uh, number one, the, the organizers of this event. Uh, thank you very much. But uh, as we'll be uh, submitting our uh, um, our, our expectations uh, to Stockholm 50 plus, I feel that there is need to also consider issues of uh, gender very seriously as we discuss, as we uh, take up all these issues. I can see on our panel, uh, there's no balance in terms of gender. Then uh, number two, um, I, I, I just want to uh, pose a question to uh, Mr. Shoko, uh, representing the government, 
in terms of uh, 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 policy uh, reviews. And uh, my, my question would be, is uh, these consultations on uh, policy reviews, uh, are you also uh, maybe targeting uh, the, 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 the institutions like our local authorities uh, so that they also contribute to these uh, policy uh, reviews. Uh, because in a uh, in lot of uh, circumstances that we came across in implementing issues to do with waste management, we have realized that the policy is uh, directing uh, issues to go in a certain way that you would see that if it's followed correctly, we can succeed. But then if you go to the local level where implementation needs to then happen, the, their policies or their uh, uh, strategies, they are also uh, pointing to another direction. For instance, one example that I can give, I can give you is on the current national development strategy one that we have, where we have an environmental uh, protection section, and they are, uh, there is a provision where the government requires uh, the nation or citizens to come up with initiatives on uh, waste management, uh, recycling. But you go to local authorities trying to find that space to bring in that it's, 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 it's something that you cannot uh, believe what you go through. But at the end of the day, the policy is clear that we need to increase that. Then I go to the uh, 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 issues of uh, polluter pays principle. Then I'll just uh, combine it with uh, the issues of uh, carbon uh, credits. I think as a nation, we need to come up with our own strategy uh, where we can maybe uh, calculate uh, our emissions and come up with uh, our, our uh, uh, ways to redeem the, 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 the credits that uh, companies or individuals would have. Because I've seen that there are a number of people that you are working with, they are willing to redeem the, their credits, but to who? how, when, and all that. So these are some of the things that maybe we need to look at as a nation and uh, address. I thank you. Uh, uh, for Mr. Facilitator, through you, mm -hmm. I think uh, since we have a number of interventions, we just yeah. take minimum of 30 seconds for each question, exactly. then the answer so that we keep track of time. So yeah. 30 seconds, colleagues. Thank you very much. Uh, I think the rule starts by me. <laughs> yeah, my name is Engineer Martin Manua, uh, Engineering Council of Zimbabwe and the World Federation of Engineering Organizations. I, I notice uh, that uh, the world is taking uh, environmental issues to an activist level. And uh, I can also see that gap here that uh, I think it should be beyond that. Uh, let us have an environmental mindset where it should start at the family level, in the training level, as early as we can. I'm saying this so because environmentally thinking should start at the designs of the whole infrastructure that we have. That design is done by professionals. I don't see the professionals at COP26 active. I see the activists with the banners. And then once the annual calendar is done, that's it. We wait for COP27. So I'm pleading that we have a consolidated ecosystem of environmental thinking where professionals, especially those that are in the design of the macro environmental factors are involved. We are amending the health professions, I mean the health, uh, the SHE Act here, SHEC. And on there, there are a lot of, uh, uh, I think medical practitioners, no engineer, no architect, the thinking is that the environment uh, or safety comes in when one has been uh, injured or when the environment is damaged. No, it's preventive. I want to see what the panel thinks, especially the regulator and government think about this. And please don't leave the engineers, the architects and the build environment practitioners behind. Otherwise we are talking shopping. Thank you so much. Uh, 30 seconds. 
Um, good morning, everyone. Um, again, just to re reiterate, um, Dumiso Madida from Bumira. I uh, come from an environmental consultancy firm. So uh, basically, the triple planetary crisis that we're facing uh, involving uh, biodiversity loss, uh, climate change, and pollution. Here in Zimbabwe, the issues that we're facing the most and the way we're trying to address this planetary crisis uh, through industry is the undertaking of environmental and social impact assessments. So I think it's mandatory through the EMA Act that these are done in industry. And it's mostly focused primarily with, uh, with the mining sector, manufacturing, construction, and so on. The challenges that we face uh, from probably will give assistance with the ministry assisting us as well as consultants. Why most people are actually moving away from undertaking these areas as, part as, as much as they're mandatory is some of the charges and exorbitant costs that we face when we undertake our consultants, when we're undertaking our stakeholder consultations. We're hoping there'll be an intervention uh, from the The ministry, way too much, probably even some of these competing with some of the fees that we charge as consultants. So this then now, uh, you know, demotivates our clients from actually undertaking these environmental impact assessments. Because we're looking at uh, issues to do with rehabilitation of these affected areas, as well as effluent and pollution control. So I think before my 30 seconds are up, uh, as a part of the panelists, Baba, you can also include us when you now amend your policies as well, uh, because I think there's a long way to go in as much as the implementation of these EIAs that we're undertaking uh, as consultants. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. Good morning. My name is Nell. Um, my question is on what the government is doing pertaining waste management at household level, because is that a there are uh, dump sites all over and as far as my assessment is concerned it's our uh, environmental degradation so i think uh, when we are looking at this it should be a holistic approach starting at family level and then you go upwards thank you uh, we have yes, someone on, uh, online. There's someone online as well that want to. All right, maybe I'll just finish with the ladies, mm -hmm. then we'll go to online since for the gender balance. Okay. Uh, two more questions from the ladies, then we'll address this. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I'll ask uh, or I'll comment on mine in 30 seconds. The first one, there has been mention of the carbon credits. I am from uh, the commercial forestry industry. And we've been told time and again, when we try to engage that uh, this does not cover commercial forestry, but I think it is really necessary because the commercial forests are planting more trees where trees have been damaged and creating employment. Then the second one is uh, where I come from, there's a lot of gold around mountains and hills and there's just, what you see now are peace halls everywhere, silted streams, dirty water flowing. There's really more that needs to be done to protect these uh, natural resources. Tobacco curing, yes, as commercial forests or timber uh, companies, we try to sell firewood to tobacco uh, producers, but there's always the tendency of first of all, finishing what is the left of the natural forest. I know something has been done or a lot is being done, but we are getting uh, behind. We are running behind and getting out of time because this degradation is really continuing. Right now, you are always meeting people with scotch cars, wheelbarrows, carrying the Musasa tree that has been uh, choked down. Lastly, the forest fires there is really need for more education. As companies, yes, we do our community liaison and uh, education, but uh, there is need for the authorities to do more in this field because there is all there. I cannot tell you a place that does not get burnt between July and November. It will be the most fortunate place, but 
it's not there from what I see uh, from my experience. Thank you. So last person facilitator, uh, then I'll handle. All right, I'll come back to the youth uh, so that we are representative. All right. Thank you. My name is Sikelo Tuve. I'm the Zimbabwe Science Ambassador, and I'll contribute on the Academia Beats. For starters, I would like to acknowledge that the Ministry of Education has done a lot in terms of making sure that students learn about the environment. As early as primary school, there is a course called Environmental Science. When you move on, there are clubs called environmental clubs. What I think we can do, adding to what Dr. Ngovizita said, is to make sure that we have correct messaging. I can imagine a booklet that can be circulated to all schools through the ministry, such that the messaging is correct and it addresses the current needs. Number two, I would also like to um, pledge my support as a Zimbabwe Science Ambassador, and we are currently leading a movement which is called Students for Environment and Climate Change. We're working with Maitri's Trust, we're working with student engineers. Uh, one of them is engineer Tariro, who is online as well. We are going to make sure that we have ambassadors who pass on messaging to the community. And if the message is through students, these are the ones who are in touch with their mothers, grandmothers in rural areas and wherever, so that we contribute immensely towards um, environmental change. Thank you. All right, facilitator, before the one online, one youth representative, please. Ah, that's the last one. I think uh, I'm really behind time, my apologies. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Kudakwa Shetluwayo. I'm here representing Vital Recycling. So I've been following the conversations that we've been having. The, so, there's so many problems that need to be solved from environment degradation. Uh, we have waste and recycling services, which are insufficient. And my question is, why are we not having the Ministry of SMEs represented in this room? Because basically it comes down to green services that are needed. Uh, look at mining, look at the waste, look at energy audits. We need businesses that are going to assist in the smooth transition to the greening of the economy. And uh, as such, um, how are the conversations that we are having um, focusing or steering in that direction to ensure that we have enough, um, we have the capacity, we have the green service industry uh, growing up as we, as we um, channel the discourse of our conversations. Thank you. All right, so we can take one question online. Uh, then we go to our panelists who have one minute or uh, to respond before we wind up. Online? Sorry. Hello. Robert, yes, go ahead. We can hear you. Yeah, I am uh, Albert Manyani from Bindura University. I just want to make some contribution on the previous uh, question on what the academia is doing regarding educating community leaders. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Go ahead, please. Can you hear me? Yes, Mr. Manyani, go ahead. Right. Uh, what I can say is that, yeah, thank you. Yeah, what I can say is that uh, academia is doing, uh, is educating community leaders. For instance, uh, last year we had some state universities which were funded uh, through the Ministry of Environment, Climate, Tourism, and Hospitality Industry, Industry to educate, that is, the provincial development committee members on a mainstreaming climate change into development projects. This was actually carried out for about nine universities, state universities. And we have also had an opportunity, for example, in my case, in March Central, to actually participate in the crafting of the uh, National Development Strategy One, in which I also had the opportunity to communicate the information on environmental issues to, to the leaders who were actually gathered to deliberate on the uh, a national uh, development strategy one for the province. So we are saying the universities, they are doing all what they can 
And we have also introduced some new programs. Like for instance, we have programs on climate change and sustainable development uh, in my university. And we also have programs in natural resource uh, management and environmental sustainability, which are also being done. All these community members are free to uh, get the programs as they will also uh, get information or more information about me. So we are saying as academia, we are trying our level our best, though we still have to do more. There are also other short courses which are coming up where we want to educate the community regarding these uh, uh, issues of the environment. I uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Manyani. Uh, your comments are well noted. I see that there are a number of colleagues online who want to make interventions, but uh, we're really running behind time and uh, my sincere apologies. Can you please make your contributions in the chat box? And alternatively, we're also going to put the link for our online consultation platform, which we're also definitely going to take your input. So please, uh, the link is going to be sent in the chat box. Make your interventions there. For our panelists, we are really running behind time. One minute, please. Uh, then we wind up. Uh, maybe just to highlight that uh, I agree with Dr. Manyani, a lot is being done in academia, but still more could be done. I think it is correct that we should work with uh, leaders, particularly community leaders, traditional leaders and so on. There are some efforts in that direction, mm -hmm. but yes, we should also uh, emphasize the process of simplifying the message, making sure the message gets out there from multiple platforms. Yeah. Um, Engineer Manoa, thank you for your supporting what I had said earlier on. Um, I'm sure you um, you were still on your way coming, uh, but I raised the issues about uh, the curriculum about the engineers. Um, that's why we have the Green Building Council, where we have engineers. I'm sure you're aware of it. And we are trying in our own way to ensure we address the issues of climate change from design. And thank you for highlighting the issue about uh, the safety, health, environment um, policy. Shake, is that the shake policy? Um, yeah, that I wasn't even aware of. I think it will do well if we have to bring it to the Green Blue Council and then we have it approached holistically. And thank you for your interventions to mention that we are supposed to relook at the, our challenge are the building bylaws, which were last changed in 1976. And um, uh, almost 40, more than 40 years down the line, we are using old ways in the, mod, in the modern world, the way so much has changed. And I'm sure the government through means of environment we, we, we are working on uh, green building standards. We will try and have those addressed in the green building standards, which we hope are going to be made law come end of day, uh, which will be over and above any other standards, uh, because the government has to meet the NDCs in the process. And um, yes, IOD, I, I'm, in my other life, I'm also with IO Institute of Directors, and yes, it is directors' responsibilities to address um, some of those things being mandatory. And the company's egg that is being changed, if yes, we we'll push our cause there, we directors will have actually a responsibility and are accountable to the environment for what they do, and not just for reporting purposes. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, the quite main questions that were directed to the ministry, uh, in fact, to government. But let me say, uh, to begin with, uh, it's, it's, uh, the issue of environment is uh, about all of us. It's not entirely about the ministry. The, 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 many, <clears throat> the, the ministry must provide, of course, the environment for people to act through provision of legislation and so forth. So, so, so it is actually a, a homework for everybody of us, for every citizen in the country to make sure that we, we abide by rules and regulations that um, are meant for the upkeep of the environment. There was mention of, for, for instance, uh, land degradation as a result of mining of chrome in the Midlands province. Yes, we are quite aware about that. And sometimes it is uh, very unfortunate that we may lack capacity to, to monitor and visit after activities. But definitely, uh, one of the issues that we come across uh, as we do consultations for uh, the reviews is that uh, 
defines that you, uh, they are too little and they are not prohibitive. Uh, this is one of the issues that we are coming across and we are hoping that by the end of the review, which is currently underway, we should be able to come up with the figures that are quite prohibitive. But I must say others, the, those that are <laughs> into mining sector, they are already also crying to say the, the fines are too high. You heard from the, the, the consultants that do EIA -E -E saying uh, the charges are, I don't know who charges more. The consultant to, the, to their customers or the ministry to the consultant. I want to submit that the consultants are too high in terms of their charges to their clients. I'm a client, by the way. We also, when I go to the consultants, the charges there are too exorbitant. That is for me. And I suspect that the ministry is actually aim at charging lower fines, low, low charges to the consultant. The consultant rips more. That argument has to be solved anyway. But oh, I'm speaking. I appreciate that word. Uh, so uh, you know what? That's why he did a, a waking breakfast. You can have a bilateral there. It's outside. So he has summarized it well. Uh, well, uh, just to, to sum it up, I, I think Isha, what we need to do is uh, in terms of governance, whereby the policies that the government is drafting and ways to enforce them. Because uh, like what uh, the engineer was saying, well, we have a group of activists uh, that are than the relevant people. Well, right here, uh, there's no representative from the Ministry of Mines. They're the ones that peg mines everywhere. And they're the ones actually, that uh, issue the certificates and they make our jobs sometimes difficult. And now coming to the companies, um, companies, uh, they should issue what are thrive for international standards, World Bank standards, IFC standards on environmental policies that would actually help us to uh, cope with the problems that we have. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, B says this is available. It's for you. Let's meet the waste management requirement for Bulawayo and the other areas that we are providing service for. In terms of training, uh, <clears throat> facilitating, implementing, as well as measuring the sustainability that we desire. Because there is no platform on measuring sustainability. We talk of the social, economic, and environmental. But we haven't set the platform, the frames that lead us to that. Yes, global reporting is being implemented, but at a limited scale. Let's help you as business council. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks so much for a participative uh, 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 panel and also the room. I really, really appreciate all the contributions, but I know you have a busy schedule during this ZITF. Uh, and uh, the program said, we, I think we started late uh, because of logistics and your entry into the room, uh, but this is a waking uh, breakfast. So please feel free to engage with our panelists. Uh, and also at the same time, uh, we are also going to exchange the national report. Uh, your contributions are going to be well captured in that national report. And we're also going to have our dialogues as, um, at the end of our uh, UNDP indicated, the official work plans which are going to be engaging with the private sector. Uh, and at the same time, I think one of the key components in terms of uh, even coming to the international uh, stations of professionals, I think uh, the government also had you engineer to have you at some of the dialogues like the COPS meetings. So I think that information is critical and also make your views in terms of the policy revisions that are also ongoing. So on that note, uh, on the behalf of our uh, 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 the Swedish government, uh, UNDP, and the organizers or co-organizers, the Minister of Environment, I would like to say thank you so much for sparing time. And please feel free uh, to join us for some uh, few bites uh, as we plan and move uh, further. Looking forward to the engagement even online. Uh, you get the link so that you can further engage afterwards. Thank you so much and have a blessed day. Thank you. Thank you.